type of the Antichrist. All right, and the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Phut, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush and Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Rama, and Sabteca, and the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Dedan, and, and Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom, in Genesis chapter 10, and verse number 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erak, and Akkad, and Calneh, and the land of Shinar. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Lord, please help this to make sense to us. Help us to understand its significance in the future here coming, its picture that is there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I believe that every major doctrine is in the book of Genesis that you can find in the whole Bible. It's almost like it's first mentioned in Genesis. Just about everything. Did you know that all the, all the symbols that are in the book of Revelation, all, all of those symbols will be found throughout the Scriptures? And did you know that they're interpreted throughout the Scriptures as to what they are? So if you look at, you don't need a, a, a symbols book. You have a book. It's called the Bible. It's called the Word of God, the words of God. And what it has in there, what does it have in there? What it has in there is a dictionary built in, an encyclopedia and a dictionary built in to explain it and to find every symbol that's in there. Don't look for what somebody else says it means. Look for it in the scriptures and see what it means there. Now, the reason why we mention what Freemasonry says is because they're using a symbol for a reason. And other occultic, uh, esoteric religions, they're using their symbols for a reason. They're hiding something in there. They use these images to hide things. All right? God reveals things. Satan conceals things. He keeps them hidden. Satan wants to keep everything hidden. He doesn't want it to come to light. He wants you to stay in darkness. He wants a mystery to be shrouded around everything. He doesn't want it to be... What did God say happened to Israel? They had a veil on them. They can't see. They're veiled. All right, so Nimrod first pictures the Antichrist. He pictures the, the one that will rule the world. Nimrod, again, was the 13th from Adam, and we talked about that. He wanted to rule the world. His name means, again, we will rebel. He was raised for such a time as that to rebel against God. That's what his whole purpose was. His whole existence was to rebel against God. That's what he was trained to do. Remember, the whole world was, was 100 or so years, 100 to 200 years from the greatest flood in history that wiped out everything except Noah's seed. That was it. But sin came back with a vengeance. And Satan started his work and sowed his seeds of wickedness quickly. Didn't take long. You know, you think history always repeats itself. You've heard that before. If you don't learn from history, it'll repeat itself. It's amazing how often it has repeated itself. Do you realize, again, 150 years from a flood, and, and, and then there's a worldwide rebellion again? I mean, it was just, just destroyed what happened. Some people didn't do their job. Some parents didn't inform their children of what just happened. They didn't continue it from generation to generation in explaining it, did they? That's what happened in Israel. When they went into the land of Canaan, what happened? And God gave them the land. It said there arose up a generation that knew not the Lord. How'd that happen? Their fathers stopped reciting it in their ears. What mean ye by these stones? They stopped giving the interpretation. So by that time, they didn't even know what those stones meant and what they were for. They had no idea. Same thing happened here. There was a group that was in rebellion. He has many names that he goes by, though, this Nimrod. It didn't take long for him to struggle, though, to become a mighty one in the earth. By the way, here are some of his names. He is known as Gilgamesh. In history, you'll find this. He is actually known as Temu sometimes. Bacchus, Mithra. That's an interesting character. Ra. You know who Ra is? The, the sun god, Ra. Pharaoh, Ra. He has the name of a god in his name because Pharaoh was a god to them. Baal. Adonias. 
Dionysus, Osiris, it's one of his most popular names, is Osiris, Orion. Those are the names that he goes by in history. I believe that Nimrod to be a type of the Antichrist and that he, is try he was trying to use the tower of what he was building to open a portal to the fourth dimension. So where do you find that in Scripture? Well, I see at the end, in Revelation chapter 18, what, he was doing, what Babylon is about. When we take the rule of first mention, we look at the Scriptures from what Babylon was, and at the time that it was, and what it will be in the end. Remember, because they just left off building the tower. Well, at the end, we see that they finish the tower, don't they? They finish whatever their building is in Babylon. Because in Revelation chapter 18, we see that it is actually what? It's the hold. It's the hold of every or foul spirit and every unclean bird. Right? That means something too. We'll get to that in a second here. I also believe that as you look at this, Babel does mean the gate of the gods. You can study that yourself and find that. It's been the historical meaning forever. That's what it means, the gate of the gods. There was something about the religion of Babel that we'll discuss in future messages that God hated so greatly that he stopped the work from continuing. Had he not, that spirit world would have probably invaded the earth at the same time. What's going to come and what is revealed unto Daniel would have came then if he didn't stop them. Because the earth was of all one language and one religion at that time. Besides the religion of the Bible, obviously, that that uh, of Shem. Nimrod sought a kingdom to rule the world and a kingdom with a centralized government and religion. By the way, understand this. Government is a beast and it wants control of everything. It always has, it always will. It's just taken 200 years for America's government to get to the height of every other government in the world where it wishes to control every aspect of human life. Revelation 13 is on its way. One world government, all the world wandered after the beast. The beast will control the world. No man will buy, sell, or trade or do anything of the nature without the mark of the beast. Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 36. Turn there, please. This is describing, this is why he is a type of, Nimrod was a type of this Antichrist. Isn't it interesting that Daniel is revealing these things in Babylon? Do you find that to be a mistake? Or do you find that to be just completely ironic that God would have Daniel smack dab in the middle of Babylon revealing mysteries? From where they're, from where they'll all take place one day again? God will put his prophets and his preachers right behind enemy lines. Exactly. Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Hey, does that sound like Nimrod? Didn't Nimrod do that? Didn't he build a tower? And didn't he build a city? And didn't he become a king? And didn't he, doesn't his name mean we shall rebel? I don't care what the God of Shem says. I don't care if Shem has the promise. He'll regard not the God of his fathers. Who is the God of his fathers? The Lord, yeah. Jehovah God, that was, that was his God, but he didn't care. That was the God. That was God, but he didn't care. Neither will the Antichrist. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. You have to understand something. That's what Nimrod did. He, he, Nimrod didn't... didn't he, he magnified himself above all. He became a mighty hunter before the Lord, right before God. 
in the face of God, he became a mighty hunter. By the way, he'll not regard any other god. He'll change things. But in his estate, shall he honor the god of forces? Of war? He'll be a, you mean he'll be a, a mighty warrior? He'll be a mighty hunter? Yeah, just like Nimrod. A mighty hunter before the Lord. He will honor the god of forces, which is another... It's another story altogether anyway. But, um, and the God from whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Hmm. Nimrod stood up the same way. We shall rebel against the God of his fathers. He ignored them. But he, the Antichrist, will honor the God of forces, a warrior. Also, as we look at uh, Isaiah chapter 14, the message is given to the future Antichrist, king of Babylon. Isn't, don't you find that interesting? The king of Babylon is given a message. That message is, he's saying, that, well, I'm going to exalt myself. I'm going to be like the Most High. Do you realize this, that this, this man is going to come, and he's not, the reason why he's going to be accepted, the reason why this future Antichrist is going to be accepted is because he's not going to come saying, I represent God. He's going to come and say, I am God. And everybody wants man to be a God. Don't you get it? That's what it's all about. What do you think every superhero movie is about? It's about man having God-like powers and being a God. Why? Because that's what man really wants. It's Genesis 3. Ye shall be as gods. Satan promised ascendancy. You will ascend to be God. That's what he promised. That's what this is about. That's, by the way, that's what it's always been about. That's what the tower is about. Turn to Daniel chapter 8. You'll notice, though, that Nimrod, by his mighty hunting of men, started out little as the one that was to be submissive to Shem, but he ended up ruling the whole known world at the time. I mean, he was the one that was supposed to be submissive. He, wasn't, he was supposed to be the lineage of those that didn't rise up. But the Antichrist, he does the same in the future. Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. Wow. That's pretty high, isn't it? It's almost like there was a tower. It's almost like he ascended all the way up and even under the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and the stars to the ground. What's, that sounds like revelation, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like what's going to happen? And stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So this is another picture of Nimrod where he, he abolished the, the religion of Shem and the religion of the gods, and he started his own religion. And that's what Nimrod did in Babylon. That's what Babylon's about. It's a perversion of the true religion, of the true faith. It's always been that. And a, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Hmm. You know, the horn is a symbol of power. Did you know that? The horn is a symbol of power. And in history, you want to know who we find accompanied with a horn? Nimrod. We find him, and by the way, the first crowns that were ever used were actually horns. If you go back and study history, crowns, the crown that they had was, was a horn. 
You ever seen those older cartoons that'll show primeval things and all that? And they'll have a guy that's running around, he's got a horn on his head. Man, I've seen those a million times. Those, well, not that many times, but, but where, they have, where they have that crown, they have a horn. Uh, like a helmet with a horn on it that sticks out. And that's what they have. That's a symbol of power. Now, the horn is that symbol of power. Now, let me read you something from uh, Hislop's Two Babylons, okay? And I'll give you an understanding here. Hislop did a lot of study in many languages and many and, and materials that were 400 years old that he had gotten his hands on from the 1500s even that, that, that stated a lot of just history that had been kind of hidden and lost for a time. Anyway, uh, let me read this to you. In many and the far severed countries, horns became the symbols of sovereign power. The corona or crown that still encircles the brows of European monarchs seems remotely to be derived from the emblem of might adopted by Cronus or Saturn, who according to, uh, to uh, Parasides was the first before all others that ever wore a crown. The first regal crown appears to have been only a band in which the horns were set. From the idea of power contained in the horn, even subordinate rulers seem to have worn a circulate adorned with a single horn in token of their derived authority. Bruce the Abys Abysnian traveler gives examples of Abysnian chiefs thus decorated in regard to whom he states that the horn attracted his particular attention when he perceived that the governors of the provinces were distinguished by his headdress. In the case of sovereign powers, the royal headband was adorned sometimes with a double, sometimes a triple horn. The double horn had evidently been the original symbol of power or might on the part of sovereigns. For on the Egyptian monuments, the heads of the deified royal personages have generally no more than two horns to shadow forth their power. As sovereignty in Nimrod's case was founded on the physical force, so the two horns of the bull were the symbols of that physical force. And in accordance with this, we read that Astart put on her head a bull's head as the ensign of royalty. Astart is another one of the names for Nimrod's wife. You've seen her in Scripture called Astart, Queen of Heaven. You've also seen her in Roman Catholicism called Queen of Heaven. You've also seen her as Diana. You've also seen her as the Statue of Liberty, the Goddess Liberty that sits in front of the Capitol building, which governs all the affairs, and presides over it as a spirit, that a statue or an image of a spirit, a goddess, the androgynous being that sits above the Capitol. You think that's an accident? Are you trying to say that this country wasn't founded on godly principles? No, I'm trying to tell you that there were some good Christians here that came and fought for liberty, but there were some snakes that were called Masons that came here and they ran everything. And I hope you can prove me wrong. But one trip to D.C. ought to cover it and you'll figure out exactly what they did. Because D.C. ain't even America. I hate to break it to you, but it ain't. It's something totally different. But it's not America. Think about that one for a little while. Nimrod's headquarters were in Babylon. And so also we find the man of sin is called the king of Babylon. And in the apocalypse he is connected with mystery Babylon. Nimrod's supreme ambition and desire was to make himself a name. He had an inordinate desire for fame. Here, too, the anti-type agrees with the type pride is spoken of. What was Satan's sin? I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. Who's going to come and rule the world one day? Antichrist. He's going to come and rule the world. Nimrod was a type of that. I'll submit to you that if God did not stop that at that point... That's what would have happened. If God, you don't believe me? Well, why did God come down and end the or Why did God come down and flood the earth? What did he say he did it for? Because the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And, he, and all of flesh had corrupted itself before him. And he said, I'm gonna, I repenteth me that I have made, that I have created man on this earth. So I'm just going to destroy them all. But I'll save a remnant of them, just like he always does. He always saves a remnant. 
Amen. Always. Saves a remnant. So he, he saved this remnant, but he destroyed the whole world. That's right. It's very small. Very small. So then what happened? What did he do next? Well, then came this Tower of Babel and this, this Babylon. So we understand that he confounded the languages. Well, why? Because that stopped them from building what they were building. Was God really threatened by, let me ask you this, do, do you believe that the God of heaven was threatened by somebody building a tall structure? Now, he's not threatened by anything, but do you really think that he was concerned that this structure would reach heaven? <laughs> right, right. Do you, do you really, what, what do you think, right, that's exactly what they were reaching. They were reaching the fourth, that, that's what that was. That was a gate to reach some, that was not about just building a big tower and God's mad because they built a big building. Well, if that's the case, we got tons of big buildings today. Why doesn't he break any of these down? <laughs> well, now, I mean, so, I mean, okay, well, that could be the mystery behind Building 7. I don't know. That could, that could, that could be. That's the only thing that makes sense. Why Building 7 fell. But, uh, nothing else makes sense. All right? Nothing. No, wait, no, nothing, nothing else. How do we get on that anyway? Anyway. Well, that all, that's kind of the spirit of Babylon too, isn't it? It really is actually. Cause, any, anyway, I don't have time to get into that. But th it is interesting that 33 years from the time that that building was built, Revelation 17, okay, that you find that mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 7 and 17 and verse number 3 through 5. We see mystery Babylon there talking about the mystery. Now, pride is spoken of as condemnation of the devil. It was an impious ambition which brought about his downfall. The man of sin will be fully possessed by Satan. Fully. Hence, an insatiable pride will possess him. It is the satanic egotism which will cause him to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. John chapter 5 and verse number 42 explains why the world loved Nimrod and that the world will love the Antichrist. Turn there, John chapter 5 and verse number 42 will explain to you why the world will love the Antichrist. It says in verse number 42, But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him, him you will receive. Who does the Antichrist come in? Does he come in the name of a God? No, he comes as God. He comes as God. So Jesus is saying the same thing that Paul is saying. He's saying he's going to come, and he's going to be God to you, to those that are that believe him. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? That was the same thing that Nimrod won. He wanted the honor of a God. He wanted the honor of ruling the world. He wanted to rise above. We shall rebel. The Antichrist, like Nimrod, he desired that name for himself. By the way, in the history of Nimrod also, here's another, another symbol's matter. In the history of Nimrod is depicted as the winged one. I showed you a picture earlier of him with wings. And what is that about? Well, let me read this from Hislop's uh, Two Babylons here. There was another way in which Nimrod's power was symbolized besides by the horn. He was symbolized, a synonym for the mighty one was Abur or Abar, also signified a wing. Nimrod as head and captain of those men of war by whom he surrounded himself and who, who were the instruments of establishing his power was Baal Abarin, Lord of the Mighty Ones. Hislop, Hislop did his homework. <laughs> he did his homework. <laughs> but Baal Abaron, pronounced nearly in the same way, signified the winged one. And therefore, in symbol, he was represented not only as a horned bull, but as at once a horned and winged bull, as showing not merely that he was mighty himself, but that he had mighty ones under his command, who were ever ready to carry his will into effect and to put down all opposition to his power 
and to shadow forth the vast extent of his might, he was represented with great and wide expanding wings. This is, in a, is, this is according to a peculiar oriental idiom of which there are many examples. Baal, Lord of wrath, signifies an angry man. Baal Ashon, Lord of the tongue, an eloquent man. Baal Hastim, Lord of arrows, an archer, and in like manner Baal Abaran, Lord of wings, signifies the winged one. To this mode of representing the mighty kings of Babylon and Assyria, who imitated Nimrod and his successors, there is a manifest allusion in Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 6 through 8, for as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, that go softly and rejoice in reason, and Ramallah his son, now therefore behold, the Lord bringeth up Upon them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his banks, and he shall pass through Judah, and he shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even unto the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of the land. O Emmanuel. Wings. Assyrian. Who's the Assyrian? Was the Antichrist and Nimrod. They were both the Assyrian. Coincidence? What a vividness and force does it give to the inspired language of the prophet, and how clear it is also that the stretching forth of the Assyrian's monarch's wings that was to fill the breath of Emmanuel's land has that very symbolic meaning to which I have referenced. Visualize the overspreading by the land by his mighty ones, or hosts of armed men that the king of Babylon was to bring with him in his overflowing invasion. The knowledge of the way in which the Assyrian monarchs were represented and of the meaning of that representation gives additional force to the story of the dream of Cyrus the Great as told by Herodotus. Cyrus says the historian dreamt that he saw the son of one of, the, of his princes who was at that time in a distant province with two great wings on his shoulders, the one of which overshadowed Asia and the other Europe, from which he immediately concluded that, that he was organizing rebellion against him. The symbols of the Babylonians, which capital Cyrus had taken and whose power he had succeeded, were entirely familiar to him. And if the wings were the symbols of sovereign power and the possession of them implied the lordship over the might of the armies of the empire, it is easy to see how very naturally and suspicions of disloyalty affecting the individual in question might take shape in the manner related in the dreams of him who might harbor these suspicions. The wings signify that power. Now consider the end times Babylon. This verse that I quoted you earlier, Revelation chapter 18 and verse number 2, the wings, remember that, the wings. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. See the wings? See the power? See the centralized power that will rule the world? You see the fact that Babylon is the cage the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. It's become the habitation of devils. Now how then does he further remind us of the Antichrist? Well, if Nimrod's chief goal was the gateway of the gods, then he was trying to fulfill something that was given in a dream from God many years later by another man who ruled the world, Nebuchadnezzar. See, I believe Nimrod was given satanic... Nimrod was building Babylon up to be a world empire. It was a world empire at the time. It was the first world empire. He was the first king. Nimrod was trying to do what, Neb, what Nebuchadnezzar was revealed to God. God was giving Nebuchadnezzar dreams, but... Many, 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 many years before that, who do you think was feeding Nimrod all this information? Who was telling him to rule the world? Who was telling him that he would rule the world, that he would rise, that his rebellion would win? You say he was deluded. Yeah, he was, but so is Satan. Satan believes the same thing, that he's going to rule the world, and his son will bring man to Godhood. Because his son will have the power, the Antichrist will have the power 
You know, I'm amazed at how many people, when you look at the Antichrist and the understanding of that, how many really don't believe that he's going to be Satan's seed or Satan's son. They don't believe that. No, he's just going to, it's going to be just some guy that, you know, he, he, the, the devil's going to fill. Yeah, I believe that's going to happen. He'll be fully filled, but he's going to be his seed. Yeah. They're doing it now, trying to. Okay. Something was given. Anyway, is it that a coincidence that the same spirit of Babylon that God used Nebuchadnezzar for is the same is the same way, the same direction that they had? I mean, do you find it an accident that later in Babylon they built their own Statue of Liberty <laughs> to the dimensions of six six six? Is that about? By the way, I, I see. I was laughing because I seen a picture of a. I showed you that before when we were studying the statue. Of a church that was using that as a, that's really a, a, using an androgynous being to represent Jesus Christ is really representing Antichrist. Now you don't know that. A lot of people don't know that because the mystery is in the image. They don't understand it, but that's what it's doing. Do you find it an accident, though, that later on they do that? How about this? That everybody had to bow down to that statue? And if they didn't, where did they go? The fiery furnace? Do you find it odd that in the end of Babylon's time, in the end times, that, that there's going to be an image that is going to be arise? If you don't bow down to it, guess what? You're going to go down that fiery trail. Aren't you? Or somebody is. So what's going on? What, is, what was it all about? What was Nimrod trying to accomplish back then? Turn to Daniel chapter 2. This is what I believe he was trying to accomplish. When we did our study on the sons of God and the daughters of men, let me ask you a question. Now again, or let me ask you a question. Do you believe that the sons of God, the daughter, do you believe they had a plan? Did those fallen angels have a plan? What was their plan? The seed. They were going after what? The DNA. They were going after man's DNA. They were gonna. They they had children with them that bare children, mighty men of old, men of renown, right? They were giants, right? I've had some people say, "Well, you know, that's not really what you you think giants are. They're not really what you think they are. Well, what are they then? And how come they were always evil?" And how come even in history they just eat people? That's all they do. They just, I mean, the only good giant was the Jolly Green Giant. He was a vegetarian. He's the only vegetarian giant you'll ever see. Right? What's that? He's a vegan or something. I don't know. He's the only one that's ever made it. But uh, No. What are, they, what are they always in Scripture? Evil. Why? Why are giants always evil? If they, if there's nothing, if they, if there's nothing, no anomaly about them. If they're nothing, then why does the Bible always say? And you can see it when you're reading it. Giants, a giant. What's the deal? Because they were evil. Why? Because they were from a union that was forbidden by God. That's why. So what were they trying to do? They were trying to manipulate, so try to ruin the seed of the Messiah so he couldn't come. What else would they be doing it for? They were trying to keep him from coming. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, we see, in, we see, by the way, this is in Babylon. These secrets are being revealed in Babylon. Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 40, the fourth kingdom shall be strong. Nebuchadnezzar had this very scary dream, and it basically said that he would rule the world, but there would be a kingdom that comes one day that would cover all the world. But it would be a strange kingdom because it would be mingled, and it would be in Babylon, because it says it would be. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these 
shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And wherein thou, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they... Boy, there's that word again. They... Them. You see it in Scripture. They. Them. You ever seen that? And I will destroy them with the earth. But they shall, he says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. What? What mingles? The iron. What is the iron? It's the spirit world. It's the Antichrist. Just like what happened in Genesis 6. I believe that that's what Nimrod wanted to do. I believe that's what he was working on doing. That's what's happening in the end. God stopped it in Genesis and enslaved them all. Now we see in, in Nimrod's time, God wasn't going to flood the earth and it wasn't time to try it by fire. So what did he do? He stopped them. He confounded their languages. There's a lot of power in word, in the word, isn't there? There's a lot of power in the mouth, in the tongue. The tongue that no man can tame, right? So the Bible says. Doesn't it also say it's set on the fires of hell? And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in, these day, in, the, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to the other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You see, I believe this is what Nimrod wanted to do. He was satanically led to rule the world. And Satan saw it as a time that he could make a move and infuse his DNA into mankind again, trying to pervert the seed. Trying to do it again. Now, we, don't, we, we understand that, that the Bible speaks of Babylon and the religion of Babylon and what went on there. What, do you find it odd that every religion has a story of Nimrod and Osiris, or Nimrod, Osiris, Nimrod, Tammuz, December 25th, and a flood, yeah. December 25th, <laughs> keeps coming back up, doesn't it? It does factor in, by the way. I, by, oh, I forgot to tell you, there's one sermon I didn't tell you about that I am going to preach. Okay? <laughs> hold, on, hold on to your hats, okay? If you got one. If you don't have one, hold on to your hair. But uh, if you don't have any of that, I don't want rub your head. I don't know what to tell you. You're in trouble, okay? But I'm gonna I'm gonna preach a sermon called. Uh, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Merry Christmas from Nimrod and Babylon. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, um, <laughs> it's I didn't plan it, but it kind of just fell in. Well, I was looking. Okay, listen first. Okay, I was I was looking. I was looking in the. Uh, I was looking in the, the sermons, and I was like, you know, it's. I, I really, the whole thing started in Babylon. I mean, <laughs> Christmas started in Babylon. That's where it's from. So I figured, you know, or or Christmas wishes from Nimrod or something. That's a, that's a, <laughs> yeah, Christmas. Uh, yeah, yeah, or Merry Christmas from Babylon or something. I could, uh, anyway, uh, you know, or Nimrod and Samaris wish you a Merry Christmas. I don't know. Anyway, something like that. That's what it's going to be called. Uh, best, wi best Christmas wishes from Nimrod or something. Anyway, but, uh, and that's where it's going to go. So I'm going to have one message on that. So, um, because it all ties in. But every one, every, they all have that story. But you know what they always have the story of? This. Sons of God, daughters of men. They all have the story of it. They all have the, the androgynous, the goddess, and the God coming together, and Tammuz, they all have that story. All of them. 
whether it's Buddhism or whatever it is, Shekinah, the Shekinah glory or whatever it is, that's all from the same, it's all, by the way, it all comes from the Kabbalah, but I mean, it all is there. It's all there in every, I mean, the, the, the Queen of Heaven, Astarte, all of them, it all comes, by the way, that's, that's the, 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 the worship of the, male, the, the, the child, the mother-child worship, you know, where you see all these pictures, everybody's like, oh, that's just baby Jesus with Mary. Um, no, that's not baby Jesus with Mary. That would be the little bastard son. I'm not being rude. That's what it is. That's who it is. That's the little Antichrist with the Queen of Heaven. That's not Jesus Christ. And I hate to break it to you. He's not a baby anymore! He's in heaven. He's God. Right. He's the Ancient of Days. And He's on the throne. He's not a baby. There's no reason to go back and look in the manger. He's not there. He's not in the manger and He's not in the tomb. He's risen! Time to grow up. Put away childish things. Amen. Because all of this is from Babylon. All of that is from Babylon. All of it comes from there. All of it. And it's all part of the sacred feminine worship. People say, well, that's not what I'm doing. And I, and I don't doubt that. I don't think everybody's walking around, you know, worshiping the sacred, the sacred feminine. I, I, I understand that, okay? I get that. But it doesn't say don't do that. It says don't learn the way of the heathen. So it says don't worship after their manner. That's the way they do it. So you're not supposed to do it that way. Amen? What are you supposed to do? Follow the Bible. Amen? Just follow the Bible. By, does it not say they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth? But I like to worship Him the way that Nimrod did in Babylon. Well, that doesn't make it okay just because you want to do it. Did you know that? And I hate to break another thing to you. It don't matter what you feel like either. Because God's not going to bring you up to the throne of heaven one day and say, well, I just, I want to know, how did you feel about that? Playing, his harp, playing a harp next to you, how did you feel about that? You, you know what matters? Obedience. That's what matters. And if nobody likes it, get used to it. Get used to it. Because the closer you follow this, honestly, can, can we? I wasn't planning on preaching about this, and i got to get moving. But honestly, can I ask you a question? If everybody in the whole world likes it that, and we could all be... How, how, first of all, how can I be in agreement with the whole world about anything? Okay, so if they all like it, should I? Doesn't that scare you? I mean, in the military now, they're being expelled for saying Jesus' name. So this does it strike you as odd that everybody's going, oh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Honestly. So what spirit is it of then if they all like it? If it pleases the world, which it does for the most part, for the most part, then, then what do we, I mean... Who cares what anybody? Who cares if somebody gets upset with you? Who cares? Anyway, 
By the way, you see, I, that was Nimrod's go. I, that's the sacred feminine we were talking about. That every culture has the mix. Every every culture has the story of this goddess. I mean, Da Vinci. You ever seen any of his paintings? Yeah, don't. They're kind of perverted, but they are perverted. Did you know they're all androgynous beings, though? When he does the one with John the Baptist, pointing his finger up this way? That's not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a hairy, rugged man that was eating bugs and wild honey, and he, and he didn't look like that, that feminine dude, that sacred feminine. Da Vinci knew what he was doing, okay? Da Vinci, da Vinci was, in, was, was a, an esoteric cultist. He knew exactly what he was doing. By the way, when you look at that picture of the Lord's Supper that he did, do you think it's an accident that right over next to him is a woman? And then if you draw in between it, it's sons of God, daughters of men. Oh, you're making that up. No, I'm not. It's right there. By the way, that woman wasn't there. Who was there? And the devil left. The devil wasn't even invited to communion. Right? What's that? The church was there. That's right. He got disciplined out. He went out and hung himself. But <laughs> Anyway, not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil. Anyway, Satan would use Nimrod and his kingdom to force a one-world religion and usher in the end of the time. I believe that's what he was trying to do. I believe Satan was trying to do what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was years later in Babylon. He had that goal. All of this was taking place in Babylon. All of it. Now this will sound weird Weird to you probably if you understand the gate of the gods and spiritual portals and things like that. That might sound weird to you, but it's not really, it's not really that weird. I mean, it's not weird when occultists and Satanists, they built things on, a, on an equinox where the sun, they, they know what they're doing, okay? They know what the stars are. They, when they plotted out America and Columbus, the good Christian, Knights Templar, um, came to America and <laughs> plotted out along the certain degrees perfectly. Plotted. By the way, when you see a red cross like that on a big old ship, when you see a picture of, like the ships and the depiction of that, that big old red cross has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It does have to do with the Knights Templar, though, the founders of the Illuminati, the Jesuit priests. That's what that is. But I do believe that that's the gate of the gods, like it says in history, but that quite, that quite possibly could be the spot to unlock that key to the abyss that Lucifer would be given the key. I believe he tried, I think he wanted to get it there. I think he wanted to move it on right there. And Nimrod had built that kingdom to do such a thing. I am sure that Nimrod was promised the world and all that went with it. But the infusion of satanic deception was very strong in Nimrod. He that was the one that was little would rise up. You look at, but God came down and changed the plans. Why? If nothing big was going on and nothing big was going to happen from this, then why was he doing it? Turn to Genesis chapter 11 and we'll be done. We'll be leaving. Genesis chapter 11. It's my third close. I'm ready to, I'm ready to be done. I'm not Brother Russ. I don't have five or six of them. I just have, I just have three of them. So I think this is the third one. So. Genesis 11.5. I gave you some extra tidbits today, though, that were free. I'm not asking for a bonus or anything, but just... Genesis 11.5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they begin to do. They begin to do what? Build a tower. Hmm. All one language. You know, if everybody has the same language, you can accomplish a lot. 
Just ask a guy that has a crew full of Mexicans that he can't he, he can't uh, speak to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, so they all had the same language. I preached. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Wow. Anyway. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Is one. They're one. What were they going to do with that? They were unified. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Then go back to Genesis, or then understand what happened. Well, anyway, go to let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. It doesn't say that it was ended for good. It doesn't say it was destroyed for good. It just says that they left off to build the city. The work's not finished yet. Now, the Tower of Babel is said to, when you look at it, it's designed a lot like DNA, okay? That's, that's the way that it's designed. Now, it's designed on that, for, that way for purpose because there's a goal in mind. That's that, that, that Daniel chapter 2 goal that was there. What is the goal now to make all one, to be all one? Uh, this world is looking for that superman. It wants that one. But all, why are they designing everything after DNA? Why, is, why are all the esoteric religions designed after DNA? Why do they talk about it? Why is everything they make like that? Why, do they, why does each pillar of Freemasonry have you know, 23 and 23? Why do they do that? What is that? There, there's a reason that they do all that. Because, okay, what do we see today in society? What we see today is we are trying to make hybrids. We are trying to mix certain things. Now they're saying they can make you, they can make people now, DNA now, and take out certain diseases and put in what they want. So designer kid. Well, Satan understands that. Satan knows about manipulation of DNA. Satan understands hybrids, and he understands how to do all those things. But it says the Lord scattered them abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. All the earth confounded. Nobody could no longer work together. Only groups of people that had the same language, and they had to find, figure that out. That must have took some time. So they all kind of settled in different areas, and they spread across the world. But with them, they took the religion that was taught in Babylon. That's why you have the ten different names of Nimrod, but the same person. That's why you have the sacred feminine. That's why you have the goddess and the god. That's why you have every story in every single group has a story about the gods coming down to the, you know, and and uh, and um, you know, having children, marrying and having children, offspring. Then over the next couple days, think about Genesis chapter 3 and think about God saying he would put en enmity between thy seed and her seed. And that, that there was a reason for that, that he put that enmity there, that Satan has a seed. And there's a reason that enmity is. Now, what's going to happen in the end times? Well, it says that that seed will be mingled with the seed of man for a reason. Why? Because they're looking for God the one that will come that will be God on this earth. That's why they're doing so much genetic modifying and genetic testing and genetic engineering. And they already are. They're cloning different things. They are, they are actually adding and taking away different things. They, they, they want to they wanna bring animals and humans together. Blood into pigs' hearts and human blood into pigs' hearts. And I showed you some of the stories last time when we talked about that. So those are the gold. I believe that's the same thing that happened in Nimrod. It's just take. Did you see how it's taken thousands of years to gather that information again? God knew what He was doing, didn't He? When He confounded their language, because then you set up also sects of people that would war against each other. 
So it would take time before it would come around again. But we see Babylon rising again, and we see the power of Babylon. You're going to also see spiritual Babylon, which which you'll see. I mean, we'll talk about spiritual Babylon. We'll talk about the power of spiritual Babylon, even in today's churches, that spirit that's there. And then the end times and what's going to come of it. But all the fault... Remember, the harlot... Right? Mystery, Babylon, the mother of all harlots. What are harlots in Scripture? False religions, false doctrines. Incidentally, who are, most, who are the leaders in false doctrine today? Women. Who start the most false religions and run the most false religions? Women. That's not an accident either. It was foretold about. But you see, that, that, that's where all this false doctrine comes from. That's why we have to have a Merry Christmas from Babylon sermon. or We, we have to have one of those. You know, Nimrod's Christmas or something. I don't know. I haven't figured it out yet what I'm going to call it. but It'll be Brother Russ's second favorite title. Please share it with everybody. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. And Lord, as we actually just scratched the surface, Lord, and haven't gotten anything deep yet, but that's coming, Lord. And I, I just wanted to get some generalized things out there first. Lord, I do pray that it would be profitable to those that heard it, Lord, and that we'd really understand this spirit of Babylon and what it's all about and what it teaches. Help us, Lord, to understand these things and help us to... Have a blessed time with our families and give us strength to continue the week for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.